Lunch Hour. Thank you for joining us once again. Uh, this is the UWGB Coffrin School of Business Summer Series Technology in Context. Whoops. Um, everybody still there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so today is the third installment in our series. My name is Oliver Buxa. I am the Executive in Residence for Digital Transformation at the Coffrin School of Business. Um, in our first two sessions, we talked about digital transformation at a, uh, in a, from a big picture perspective and about the AI um, family of technologies. If you are interested in these recordings, let Catherine know. She can send you a link to the documents and to the, to the full recordings. Today, we're going to talk about interface technologies. I'm not sure if that's an official technology category, but I like to use it as a catch-all for technologies that allow us to speak to machines and also allow us to receive information back from machines. So you're going to learn about virtual reality, augmented reality, and uh, some other things, uh, including a recap of some of um, what we discussed last time. So um, again, for parts. Uh, the, the first part, I'm briefly going to look at the history of interactions between human and machines. This is not going to be very comprehensive, but I want to just showcase how far we've come. Um, and then we're going to zoom in on that user interface aspect. Um, how do we connect with machines? What are some of the new technologies that are coming? And then where are the trends headed? Uh, what's sort of the most likely outcome? And then as always, if time permits, I want to push the envelope a little bit and talk about what's maybe even beyond the horizon of what we can see today. So early human machine interaction was purely mechanical. For one, there was no power, right? There was no understanding, but just think about how much the world could be changed through mechanical interaction. On the left, you see the first book press that Gutenberg invented. And just think about how the widespread availability of printed materials changed the world, changed the opportunities of education. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see uh, a mechanized loom, a textile factory. And here sort of the fascinating thing is just the dimension of the machine and then sort of the humans, almost like an attachment to the machine performing certain tasks. But it was all mechanical. There was no way of really communicating with the machine other than touching it. This is where we are today. We have machines that are highly autonomous. They can see, they can move through the environment, they can hear, uh, and depending on what modules they are equipped with, they can also verbally communicate uh, with us. So we've come a very long way in, in our understanding what even is a machine um, and how do we interact with those machines. In the early days uh, after the electrification had occurred, um, the ability to communicate with machines was very limited. The picture that's shown here is an IBM punch card. So in order to tell the machine, you know, execute a certain sequence of, of commands, uh, one of these cards had to be punched by someone who understood the exact logic, and then the machine could read that and could then um, perform the calculations. That's what it typically was in the early days, the calculations and spit out the result. On the right hand side, you see uh, a number of programming languages, right? So there was a two layered interaction with the machine. The first one was um, a very skilled engineer had to program the machine so that it was able to do something. And then a user um, could, you know, insert certain commands or push certain buttons uh, for the machine to do something. So I'm going to focus mostly on that user interface um, aspect. And that user interface has changed a lot over time as well. Um, some systems, even today, still have the, the infamous green screen, uh, sort of a very standardized way, um, a certain font against a black background. And, and that was how information was um, inserted into a database. Certain commands uh, were given uh, to the machine one at a time. 
and then the output was typically presented um, either with a sort of a line output or a printout uh, from the machine. Uh, Windows obviously was a huge improvement, and this is a much enhanced version of Windows now, where a graphical user interface uh, organized intuitively in the way maybe we have our file cabinet at home, um, you know, click and drag and drop things, uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, almost a child could interact with the machine because it was much more intuitive to do it. Um, now we've moved to interfaces that sit on the wrist of our hands. Some of these smartwatches are now approaching the computing capabilities of the first space shuttles. It's quite remarkable uh, if you think about it. So technology is now with us. It's packaged in, in, in very small portions and uh, typically we can already speak uh, to those devices. And then on the bottom, you so, sort of see the range of uh, Alexa Echo um, devices. They come in all forms and shapes and, and price points. Uh, and that is the evolution of the interface from a visual interface to a verbal interface, or in some cases, both verbal and visual. So that's what we're going to explore today, that verbal visual frontier, and where, where is that moving to? So let's start with a verbal. This is something we've covered last time, natural language understanding. Uh, this was a huge breakthrough to essentially decode language and then uh, based on semantic elements of language, teach a machine to listen to the sound, identify the sound, assign certain you know, sound patterns to words, uh, combine words to sentences, and then understand what the meaning of that structure is that that was being created both in receiving it in hearing it and then in being able to articulate it and uh, this is something we've also covered last time uh, conversational ai is now the most evolved form of verbal interaction between uh, human and machine uh, it is programmed to understand um, what people are saying, not just the language recognition, but the meaning identification in a, in a broad variety of ways and connotations uh, and can extract with much higher reliability what the intent of the communication is so that the answer makes sense to us. It is uh, in line with, with our intent. I mean, even when I speak to, to my kids or my wife or somebody at a party, there's sometimes misunderstandings. So even human to human communication is not free uh, from from misunderstandings, um, but conversational AI is sort of beginning to mimic that process of understanding a broad range of intended uh, meaning. So verbal, we understand a little bit. We've covered that now, um, but let's let's go into the field of visual. Um, you could argue that the green screen was visual, uh, Windows is visual, right? But it is a two-dimensional visual output. I, I need to look at a screen and there are certain limitations. Um, a much more natural presentation of information would be three-dimensional. Um, and augmented reality is a really exciting uh, technology that combines a view of the real world with information that is inserted into that view of the real world, hence the term augmented. Here's an example. This person is looking at a machine and they're using their iPad. So behind the iPad, if you could see the actual machine, um, all you would see is the machine itself. But through the program, um, a computer generated view of a certain part of the machine is superimposed on that view and the user can now tap that part. It could identify, you know, what are the steps to remove that part. And so uh, this can guide an engineer in the critical steps of maintaining, taking apart, putting back together a machine. That's just one of many applications. Here's another one. This person is looking at um, the street in a, in a city that they maybe don't understand. And Augmented reality is basically superimposing. Here is the path you have to take. You have to walk down this road, then go to the left. If some of you are avid video game players or your kids are, 
Uh, maybe you have played Pokemon Go. That's another example of augmented reality where through your phone, uh, you basically gain access into a view of the world that is not real, but it feels real that little characters are appearing on your living room table or uh, somewhere on the street and you can try uh, to catch them. So all of that is augmented reality. And we'll see a few more uh, examples. Uh, augmented reality can be presented to the recipient through the device. So you can look at the world through your uh, phone or through your iPad if it has camera functions or through these augmented reality glasses. So the, the beauty of the glasses is that you now basically have both hands free to interact with whatever you're looking at. Uh, if you're working on a machine, if you're a surgeon and you're conducting a surgery, um, the uh, looking through the screen essentially um, allows you to see the real world and then a projector uh, projects into that screen so that your eyes can also perceive the um, computer overlaid information. The original idea was to give the computing power of a computer, a laptop, to people who needed to work with their hands. That was the idea. And the HoloLens is probably the most prominent um, of these devices, but there are also others. A second technology is virtual reality. In virtual reality, you don't see the real world. You are immersed into a computer generated world. So typically the type of glasses you wear are um, you know, covering your eyes completely, shielding you from seeing any part of the outside world. And um, you know that has some advantages and some disadvantages. You can get disoriented, you can fall down, you can lose your balance, um, but you are now presented uh, in a sort of fantastical world, depending on how complex the simulation is that you are looking at. Um, here you see some people um, sitting in a real Jeep vehicle uh, and the vehicle is, is a simulator, so it kind of bounces up and down a little bit, but as they look through the through the virtual reality glasses, they see a simulated ride through the wilderness. And, and the interesting thing is you can look up, you can look to the side, to the left, to the right, to the front. Um, there's a 360 view essentially of the world as you would see it. So that makes it feel very realistic. It's not just a forward view of the information because you can program any uh, environment in a in a 360 degree um, display. Here is somebody participating in research in a company that's actually located in the pier called Wild Blue. So they have the virtual reality glasses and they go shopping. Uh, they are in a virtual supermarket and they go shopping and Wild Blue is basically testing how changes to the packaging, to the color uh, and so forth of different products are changing um, sort of user behavior in shopping for those products. Much cheaper than creating a real supermarket uh, and creating all the different packaging and putting it on there so you can basically manipulate the environment much more easily and test for a lot of variations. Um, here is a young man being trained at Walmart. So um, you, you may have walked into Walmart and there are greeters um, or, you know, there are other employees throughout the store. And, um, you know, one of the things that Walmart has recognized is uh, they wanted to do a better job at preparing their employees for a wide range of customer interaction scenarios, not just saying hello to everyone and goodbye and have a good day, but to recognize, is someone coming with children? Should they use the specialized cards? Does somebody have difficulty walking? Or you know, does somebody have questions? What if somebody comes in and they're agitated? You could even take that all the way to identifying threats or what to do in a, in a first shooter scenario. I'm not sure that they're training on that, but it's possible. And uh, so interestingly here, an artificial environment in which you interact with non-real characters is being used to prepare people for real life human interactions. And one of the reasons is that the cost of failure is much lower. You know, you could make a mistake in virtual reality, you could say something incorrect, you could you know, tick off a customer, um, but that's 
you know, a safe environment. It's not a real environment. And then when you are deployed in the real environment, you are actually already much better at your job, at your skill, and the real customers are going to be happy with what you're doing. Here's a third um, technology that you may not have heard of yet. It's called parallel reality. Um, if you look at a TV screen today, the TV screen is made up of millions of pixels. But today, each pixel can emit only one type of light. So that means if you're sitting in a living room with your family, everybody looking at that TV is seeing the same information because every pixel is emitting the same type of light into all directions. Um, there's a company, Misapplied Sciences, and they've developed a new type of pixel that can emit different types of light into different directions. So theoretically and practically, you can let different people in different parts, in different angles from the, from the screen, see different images. Obviously, you have to coordinate all of these pixels um, so that the person at a certain angle sees that picture. Here's an example. Um, this, these pictures were taken in Las Vegas by me. So I, my angle in looking at the screen, I was seeing the Eiffel Tower, Paris, right? But then in the back of the room, there were 12 mirrors and they were, you know, assorted in, in such a way that they kind of looked, they all looked at the screen, but from different heights and from different angles. And so um, my view was there, but there were also 11 other views. So the that one screen essentially simultaneously projected 12 different images. Now, why would we need something like that? Imagine you're at an airport and today you're looking up at the screen to identify, uh, you know, is your flight on time and you have to go through the 200 flights that are being displayed on that big screen in very small font. Um, in the future, this could work very differently. Uh, once you have checked in at the airport, uh, with a little kiosk, um, you actually basically gave your information to the kiosk. And if the kiosk has a camera, th the kiosk now knows, or the system, the airport system now knows what you look like and could track you. And if the system recognizes you standing before the big arrival and departure screen, it could now say, hey, Catherine, uh, you have 30 minutes before your flight departs. Please advance to gate D6. And this message would be projected based on where the system has recognized that you stand. So it's not that everybody now sees the message intended for Catherine, but only Catherine, or maybe if somebody stands like right behind her looking at the screen in the same angle, they might see it as well. So this could be the future of communication, and that could be used in, in tourist spots, uh, but it could also be used for marketing. Just think about a mall uh, you walk down the mall today and there's the electronic display in the center of the mall and everybody sees the same message. But now imagine you could tailor that based on the system's recognition of who's coming at me, different people. Um, are they male, female? How old are they? How are they dressed? Uh, and using facial recognition, even what mood are they in? And then instantaneously basically make decisions on what products uh, to present to them what shops to direct them to so we could live in a future world in which many of us are in the same environment but the information that we are presented with may not be the same another uh, visual technology is a holograph in a holographic uh, technology multiple light sources create a three-dimensional view uh, some of these uh, holographs uh, or some of these projected objects uh, you can even interact with. So let's say this was the projection of a ball. Uh, the system could now recognize that someone is attempting to touch that ball, lifting it up, raising it or turning it in a, in a 360 degree angle and could adjust the representation of that ball accordingly. Um, if you watch the Iron Man movies, you know, when when um, uh, Tony Stark is always interacting with Jarvis. He's basically sort of moving projected imagery around, and, and that would basically be holographic um, technology. One of the big advantages is that this is not specific to the view of one individual. So in augmented reality, everybody 
could see uh, a, a superimposed image, but they're not necessarily all seeing the same image. You have to really use a lot of processing power to make sure everybody would see the same um, image. In a holograph, you could have a team of people stand around and they would all be looking at the same thing, maybe the prototype of a new car, and they could comment on it and, and interact with it. It is, however, a much more expensive technology. And so it is only used in uh, sort of high value uh, occasions today. And you know, my take is the individualized view uh, will probably win out over this type of technology. So um, this was a, a quick run through some of the interface technologies. Now let's, let's kind of look ahead what's going to happen here. Um, if you go back in the history of human language, in the beginning, all we could do was really talk to each other, right? We had to learn to communicate with clarity. And now that machines have that ability, the most natural form of telling someone what we want, of telling someone what to do, is to give them a verbal command, as opposed to translating that verbal command into a series of software code commands um, that maybe only certain people could execute, right? We don't want to have the need for translation. We want to be able to say, do this, and the machine can do it. I don't know if you recall last week we we did some an AI challenge and somebody said, oh, if I have if I had to design an AI, I would create a little robot that could weed around my house or my farm and recognize the different weeds. Right. So now imagine you had a robot like that and you could now say, all right, um, this robot is not yet configured to weed around your property. But instead of going to IBM and paying thousands of dollars to have it programmed, uh, at some point in the future, we might be able to say, all right, um, you know, whatever the name of the robot is, robot, um, download an image library of Midwestern weeds uh, or find different visual libraries of Midwestern weeds. And the robot would respond, I found one at UW Extension, uh, you know, select um, mid-stage maturity to blooming stage images um, and you know then we maybe tell them you know select dandelions and milkweed and um, wood sorrel and so we're, we're basically communicating to the machine what weeds we wanted to pull out uh, i could then say um, you know go to zillow pull the property boundaries um, this is your work area. You know, you're going to work within the property boundaries. Um, I could now tell the machine maybe to go out into the garage and change its um, attachments to the wheat pulling attachment and so forth. So I don't need to be an engineer anymore. Uh, in fact, at some point, um, a child will be able to tell the machine how to configure itself, uh, what what knowledge to pull from a vast um array of of options and what to execute um so these interfaces will be all around us um many of us already have alexa siri and so forth we have it in our phones we have it soon in our tvs uh, in screens in home security devices smart speakers earbuds etc cetera, etc cetera. cars it's going to be really big in 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 cars um and so then uh, comes the point where these devices will also communicate with each other. So let's say you start the conversation with Alexa in your home and you say, hey, Alexa, um, I want to go on a trip with my family today. What are some good options? Where are events today in northern Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera. So Alexa presents me with some options. And then I say, all right, Alexa, you know, I want to go to Minocqua, uh to, to go to the go-kart track. So now I go out into my car. And instead of sort of having to start all over, Alexa has already forwarded that information to my car. So the car is now basically ready and primed to take me to, to Minocqua uh, and may even remind me uh, that the bicycle rack is not yet attached, depending on, again, the, the capabilities and the scope of activity that we want these machines to perform. Are they only executing downstream from our commands, so they do as we say, 
or are they thought partners? Are they programmed to sort of challenge us and remind us and have you thought about this and what about this? And, and does everybody have their jacket? Does everybody have their uh, sleeping bags or did you pack sunscreen for the kids, right? So all of that um, can be configured uh, in the future. And uh, one of the things um, from an education uh, perspective that's gonna be really important is um, the ability of machines to translate. So say I'm hearing something in one language, but maybe that's not my native language. I'd be more comfortable hearing it in German or in French or in, in you know, another language. So the language capabilities, now that the machines can understand, they can also translate in, the, in a split second and then communicate back to me in a different language. Um, that could also be applied, say you have a professor who is not a native speaker and they speak with a very heavy accent. And maybe some people who are also not native speakers or who are native speakers, but are challenged by that accent, have a hard time understanding it. So you could um, you know, configure a machine to understand the accent of that professor really well. And then if you wanted to um, you know, have a, a soundtrack that is accent free, or a soundtrack that is in Chinese, or a soundtrack that is in, in German. So the ability of communicating to diverse audiences without intermittent translation is gonna be, you know, sort of at the, at the tip of our fingers. Um, it's almost like the, the universal transponder or translator device that they had in Star Trek. And whenever they came to a new planet, they could talk to aliens because the machine would translate whatever they were saying and hearing. Um, so more voices in more devices, if you can talk to your earbuds, if you can talk to your phone, uh, to your you know augmented reality goggles, you can sort of direct everything by phone and you can, you know, tell the device what to do, what information to pull. The next thing is then uh, personaliz personalization. So we may want to hear a voice, a female voice, a younger female voice, um, maybe a more energetic voice, maybe a, maybe a calm voice. And I mentioned earlier, um, you know, do I want that voice to just only take my commands and, and answer my questions, or do I want it to be conversational? Do I want it to remind me of things, understand my weaknesses and sort of play off of that? And ultimately what that results in is we're gonna be surrounded by a system that speaks to us. It can speak to us uh, all the time, depending on our preferences. And that's what people call the ambient assistance. It's always there, it's always on the little voice in our head. Um, we literally have to turn it off, but it is configured to meet our specific needs and then uh, you know clearly different brands are going to look to um, you know put their personal touch on that so we're going to see a range of options available in the market so for teachers for example this could provide uh, fascinating opportunities in uh, you know uh, reviewing and scoring homework submissions right um, I could communicate with my system on what I wanted to do uh, you know, screen these reports. Uh, do I want them to screen for uh, just grammatical correctness, content correctness, multiple choice would be really easy to do, or post post the latest. Um, you know, I've just finished my PowerPoint. Post that to Google Classroom or to whatever uh, system is being shared. The subroutines are embedded in the machine, so there's still a lot of programming work that needs to be done um, to make these things voice controlled. But all these things that today require multiple steps in the future, uh, the machines are gonna understand our voices and they can act on the clarity in those voices. For the students, it may also mean increased productivity. Um, you know, Not having to go back, maybe if they're listening to a recording, going back and back, uh, trying to understand what that means. Um, interacting with content, uh, You know, they're listening to a lecture, they pause the lecture and they say, hey, uh, Google, find me some cross references on, um, you know, micro learning or whatever, whatever topic they're on right now. Because it is an intuitive process, we are used to communicating 
via voice. It's the fastest way of getting to the information as long as there is high reliability on the side of the machine to understand what we're saying and the intent of what we're saying. Here's a uh, switching back from voice to visual. Here's a, a use case of augmented reality. So these devices not only have a screen into which um, information is projected for us to see, but they typically also have a camera. And so they can, you can create a recording. Uh, in this case, an engineer is executing a certain sequence of steps and they are recording how they're going through those steps. And then later on, they're using uh, a computer program to superimpose uh, information, like the little screen, excuse me, the little screen you see on the top left, step five, step six, right? You can superimpose that or a more detailed view of the appliance to create a training video. And um, these augmented reality training videos have proven to have a much higher effectiveness than the typical uh, you know, two-dimensional standardized uh, training videos. So the future of practical learning may also very well draw on augmented reality once these headsets become a little bit more uh, affordable. Here's an example of augmented reality in surgery. Today, medical professionals have, you know, say they have um, performed an MRI scan on a patient so today they look at the results of the MRI scan um, you know, on their computer screen and then they look at the patient. Um, augmented reality would allow you to superimpose the results of the MRI onto the patient and doctors could now plan for that surgery or you know, identify the exact location of, of pain relative to what they're seeing in the MRI. They could touch the patient and say, you know, is this where the pain is? and you know, sort of drill deeper into the layers of the MRI. So it's a fascinating technology to provide us with uh, a much deeper view of information than uh, the pure view of reality or the pure view of the computerized information would allow us to receive. Here's an example of virtual reality. I mentioned earlier, you, you can create an environment that is as creative and as fantastic as you want. Uh, GoPuff is catering to students. Um, they allow students to, to basically go onto their device and immerse themselves into a retail environment. And in that retail environment, students can interact with, you know, the chocolate fountain or the, you know, um, whatever is in that store in a very creative way. And they basically choose their snacks. Uh, from that experience and then GoPuff delivers still in the real world uh, because they, they don't have a store that you can go to on campus, but they have a store near campus and then a delivery guy brings everything. So shopping is transformed from the mundane task of going to a store, picking the items off the shelf, carrying them home and eating them to an enjoyable experience, uh, maybe with varying themes every day. Um, and then you receive essentially what you've selected from your, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland type of visual experience. Um, learning, um, you know, children learn a lot through screens, especially during COVID, you know, it was the primary way of learning the school issued tablets or the computer screen that they were looking at. Um, in the future, it's gonna be a little bit more multidimensional. There may still be the devices uh, the educational devices, but there may also be uh, companion toys, uh, companion toys that can see, that can speak, that can see what the child can see on the device and maybe alert the parent that this is inappropriate or maybe even interact with the device immediately to cancel out content and protect uh, the child. Um, virtual reality in the classroom creating much more engaging experiences, you know, flying through Disneyland or flying over the mountains, uh, immersing yourself into the jungle, finding the hidden jaguars in the jungle. There are so many things. And whenever we can create excitement and engagement and motivation in our students, we know that the learning and retention effect uh, is, is amplified. Um, 
on a simpler level, uh, interfaces, uh, you know, even if they're just apps or screens, uh, are going to be a key to social engagement. For many seniors, um, social isolation is a huge challenge. And many companies have picked up on that, whether it's Portal or My Facebook or you know, dating apps for, for seniors or even gaming apps. You know, one of the world's biggest uh, games is actually sort of engaging seniors to play with each other, right? So we can create a world of engagement. And that engagement could then also extend to not just engaging with each other through the machine, but engaging with the machine. Many years ago, there was the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix, where he basically fell in love with his AI-based personal assistant. Um, it, as far as I recall, it didn't have a face, it didn't have a, a, a body or anything like that. It was just the personality and the constant interaction that made him fall in love with that AI-based um, character. So is that so unlikely that we would, you know, like, become used to, become attached to, become maybe addicted to and, and maybe even fall in love with a machine, with a program? Um, and what if that machine wasn't anonymous? What if it actually had a face, um, if it had a body? So there's uh, a, a reality of human machine interface that we're beginning to move into where the boundaries are beginning to blur. And so talking about blurring boundaries, um, the ultimate interface is beyond voice and vision. The ultimate interface is inside of our head. If we could think it and the machine understands it, knows it, that would be extremely powerful. Um, so today, uh, the, where the research is going with that is mainly uh, to help people who maybe have lost limbs or are otherwise physically impaired. Um, and these devices are trying to decode the impulses the brain sends to the muscles and then use these impulses, interpret these impulses, translate them into technology commands that basically move a hand or a leg or a, another um, extremity. Now, the military um, is interested in a, in a slightly different aspect, not just helping disabled veterans, but to say, hey, could we control a robot uh, in the field through the thoughts of a soldier who is a thousand miles away? You know, could basically the, the soldier connect, link up with that robot? It's like the movie Avatar, right? Um, and now whatever the robot sees, the soldier can see, whatever the soldier thinks, the robot can do. So not only do I have a highly capable fighting machine out in the field, but I have the flexibility of the human operator essentially connected seamlessly with the machine. Um, there are a couple of issues today in research. Uh, most of these decoders of these devices are being created based on healthy uh, populations, uh, healthy subjects. And the, the impulses from healthy subjects may actually be different from the impulses of someone who has already lost an arm or lost a leg. But you know that is something that research is working through. Uh, this is an example of a modular hand. So these um, sensors that are placed around the arm uh, can record nerve impulses that are being generated by the brain. So in this case, it's not decoded in the brain itself. It is decoded in the peripheral um, extremity, but it can then uh, identify those impulses based on the electrical pattern. And essentially, the subject can learn to, you know, in this case, grab a water bottle and drink uh, from that water bottle with reasonable reliability. So there's Obviously, you don't strap this on and it works. You have to learn to sort of encode the machine with every thought, with every movement. So this, this is a process that takes time. Uh, Facebook um, paid a billion dollars for a startup uh, with the idea of controlling computers with your mind. So here again, uh, can we decode? In this case, it would be a much more complex pattern, right? Because it's not just 
lift my hand, you know, move my thumb. Uh, in this case, it would be a much more complex patterns of thoughts. But can we decode those thoughts uh, that might, you know, play a video game or tell the computer what to do? So in this case, we don't even have to verbalize it anymore for the computer to understand what we want from it. But the idea would be, could we think it? And however remote the possibility is that this ultimately works out, it it was worth a billion dollars to Facebook to sort of play with the option of acquiring and perfecting this technology. So this is sort of, um, you know, if, if you're a, a star Trek fan, the Borg, right? Resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. Uh, what will that fusion of man and machine ultimately look like? Uh, in, in this scenario, obviously, um, the humans were deprived of any uh, willpower. They were just um, part of a, of a machine organism, if you will. But there are already uh, a number of devices that are being implanted, typically to overcome some uh, disability or impairment in our bodies today. That number of devices is going to grow. Uh, here's an example of a Wisconsin company that is producing a tiny little microchip and you can implant that between your thumb and your index finger. And um, basically you use it like a, like a, a identity batch, right? Um, so you go to a machine, you wanna buy something, you swipe your hand or just lift your hand. It traces where you are. Um, it can certainly also trace what you do. I don't think it can read your thoughts yet, but I find it a little bit scary that this is implanted in me because then I can't take it off. I can leave my badge on, on the counter. And even though the company promises that they're not tracking employees outside of the facility, it certainly would be possible to locate that chip and, and track the individual. But in the same way as we thought, you know, maybe carrying around a smartphone that tells Google where we are exactly in the world and what we're looking at would have been inconceivable 10 years ago. Today, everybody does it because there's a convenience that comes with it. And maybe here we have at some point uh, something embedded in our ear that allows us to hear, something embedded in our eyes that allows us to see images, something embedded um, in our hand that allows us to sort of point and manipulate computer generated content. Uh, so we're, we're moving into this era of the augmented human. Um, artificial skin, this is, uh, at an initial stage, uh, it is meant to replicate human touch. So uh, robots today, while they have touch sensors, they are nowhere near the receptiveness of human skin touch and the, the multitude of neurons that we have. But what if you could create something that delicate that a robot could touch a cat or a, a fluffy little chick and basically not only handle it, uh, with the sensitivity that a human would apply, but actually feel the softness of the fur and receive that. Um, another application of this may be that, you know, burn victims uh, could maybe uh, receive, um, you know, a replica of, of real skin with artificial skin and feel uh, again. This, of course, would then require another interface between the brain and this artificial skin. So the future of augmented humans, this is an article by Roberto Serraco um, for IEEE. And uh, so, you know, he is sort of projecting out that by 2050, it will be difficult to separate living from non-living things. So a little bit like Robin Williams' Bicentennial Man, right? Machines are gonna take on more and more human-like characteristics their ability to think, their ability to speak. And humans are going to carry certain machines, machine parts. So he believes there will be a symbiotic being that will be recognized as such, right? There's not no longer just human and machine. There is sort of the human, the enhanced human. There's the machine, there's the intelligent machine, there's the autonomously intelligent machine and maybe somewhere in between is then that humanoid robot 
um, that is going to be you know difficult to distinguish in its capabilities and its emotions and its cognitive processes from a human. So a little bit of a scary future, but uh, at the pace that technology is moving, I would not be surprised in 2050, frankly, that's that's in the lifetime of, of our children at least, uh, that we might get there. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, walk from the uh, first printing press all the way to um, the future of, of sort of the fusion of humans and uh, machines. And I certainly want to take some time now to answer questions. Does anybody have a question? Please unmute yourself if you have questions or comments. I have a quick question. Um, um, where, with the development of AI, um, where are they with discussing the ethics uh, behind some of this stuff? I mean, what's what's happening? Uh, it seems almost as if um, is there going to be a new class war that people of wealth can, you know, can afford to be augmented mm -hmm. and people of no wealth are going to be like the, uh, the slaves of the past? Yeah. So there are ethical discussions as it relates to individual technology components. So just think about access to broadband, right? Rich people have better access to broadband, so they're going to have a hold of these technologies and all their capabilities much sooner. If you don't have broadband, don't even think about augmented reality or AI. You, you, you don't have the processing power to communicate with the machine. Um, there is facial recognition, for example. Um, there's a huge ethical debate on whether or not machines should be equipped with facial recognition software. San Francisco is the first community that has outlawed the use of facial recognition software because they feel that it's too easy to spy on people, to track people, to create a record of what people are doing. And that's exactly what China is doing, for example, um, tracking its citizens and their behavior in public through, you know, public cameras everywhere and facial recognition software that identifies who is who and what are they doing. So there's a there's a, a compartmentalized ethical discussion. Then comes the big question on how do we guide the development of AI? And uh, last week I talked briefly about the ethics AI framework of the European Union. Uh, they have developed sort of a I think it's ten part framework, um, and they're trying to agree on guidelines. We have not yet adopted that framework in the United States. It, each company, Apple, Google, Facebook, and every smaller company um, is developing their own um, ethic guidelines. Um, our government officials are way behind. Um, in the early days of me doing this work, this educational work, we spoke to the Wisconsin legislature. And they were so proud that they had a steering committee on autonomous vehicles, and they were dealing with the ethical questions around that. Uh, you know, who's liable, who's who's responsible if something happens, if an accident happens. Um, there, there has to be ethical considerations of drones, uh, imagery that is being collected, uh, data that is being collected, data that that is being stored. So the technology has charged way ahead already of legislative frameworks or even foundational agreements on what ethic guidelines uh, we should adhere to. And with this pace of development, with all of these technologies technologies pushing into the pipeline, um, that gap between technological possibility and the ability to govern and regulate that is just getting bigger and bigger. It's, it's a huge issue. Other questions? Let me ask you something then. Um, which of these technologies would you be excited about? Um, you know, would you like to have glasses through which you can see, you know, overlaid information like the infamous Google glasses that kind of failed 
Um, would you like to have virtual reality instead of a TV at home so you can have more immersive experiences? Would you like to have that personal assistant, the little voice in your head that you can talk to all the time? What of this excites you and, and what of this freaks you out? Who has any thoughts on that? Well, this, is, this is Mike again. I, uh, I love traveling um, mm -hmm. and I, I love the concept of um, having that augmented reality with glasses or with some type of experience that I could experience some of the places that I would like to go to without needing to travel there. Mm -hmm. In addition, yeah. I think the the application to the medical field is incredible. This morning I have a, a close friend who's going through a four or five way uh, heart bypass surgery. I'd love to see some type of diagnostic tool that would be able to um, help us diagnose those problems in advance and, mm -hmm. and correct them. Yep. And on the travel, there's actually two aspects to that, right? One is you could substitute real travel with virtual travel. There are some providers like um, the Wild Within, they offer uh, river tours through Canada and you can have sort of a 360 degree view, not of computer generated, but of real camera footage. And you can sort of, you know, feel going down the river, at least in your mind, you, I don't think you get splashed with water and your, your, your chair doesn't shake. But that's certainly one way of, of experiencing the world without uh, ever flying there. And then the second aspect is if you do travel somewhere, you could again have your glasses on and uh, it could translate in real time. What do these signs mean? If you don't speak Russian, if you don't speak Chinese, um, they can tell you what the street signs are, what the store signs are, what everything says. Uh, it can provide you additional information on, on you know, this is the street, to, this is how you get to the temple, when you get to the temple, historical facts, right? So the, the interaction with the real world can become so much richer um, because we can overlay information. John, you have a question. Yes, I do. Uh, my biggest concern is the addictive nature of our brains. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people are addicted to drugs, alcohol, gambling, TV, uh, even their smartphones. Um, and this, I think, just expands that tenfold, a hundredfold, exponentially. And my biggest concern is, um, will we have the ability to stop? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, every time we experience some level of enjoyment, there's a little dopamine release in our brain, right? And we get used to that dopamine release. That's why video games are so addictive because they sort of, you know, keep giving us a little ping, 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 ping. Um, so you could clearly see how people lose themselves in these artificial realities. Uh, when the movie Avatar came out, there were people going to the movie theater two, three times a day uh, to re-watch that movie over and over because they didn't want to leave that world. Well, now imagine they could put on the virtual reality glasses, maybe even the haptic gloves. And there's a, there's a full body suit even that can simulate pressure on your body, right? So now they're just in the world of Avatar 24 seven, they never wanna leave. Um, you could also see how uh, for our children, um, you know, already screen time is a big concern. So now we're giving them this, you know, fantastical experience in virtual reality. Uh, it also creates an issue for their eye development because the, the distance between their eye and the screen is now only a few inches rather than being, you know, at least a foot or whatever is, is healthy. So there are physical concerns, there are emotional concerns, uh, and there are, as you pointed out, addiction concerns. Um, there's also, if you play this out further, there is a foundational challenge to our social fabric, because what happens if people begin to have relationships with machines as opposed to with other humans? What happens to our social network? Uh, what happens to the ability to even have children if we all have a robot spouse, right? Uh, in Japan, they are, are already struggling with declining birth rates. Uh, but now a lot of people in Japan are forming non-human 
relationships, right? And that's going to put a further dip into their uh, ability to maintain population levels or even have enough young people to take care of older people. So you're, you're pointing out a really important category uh, on the future of relationships. And I think that's that's one of the one of the uh, sessions we're actually going to zoom in on. I think it's the last one in our series of 10 where we'll talk about the future of relationships. Any other questions? We have a few minutes if anybody has a thought or a comment. I have a follow up comment. Um, I've loved my college reunions where they have all these two hour mini classes. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of life? What would mm -hmm. we like to be Atticus Finch, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Well, the biggest disappointment was the business ethics class. And I went to the class with several other people from the reunion. And I came away, OK, at least at this university, they teach ethics in every business class. They don't have a separate ethics class. But I also came away with they have no idea how to implement it. <laughs> and I asked the question, I work for a company that maintained our ethics. We knew our main competitor was being unethical. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line result is the ethical company went out of business. Mm. So, you know, I'm scared about that too. It's 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 a pretty scary world these days. Yeah. Yeah, I think there was um I don't remember the exact context, but there was one company in China that basically copied a product of an American company, brought it to market, and forced the American company out of business and then essentially used its valuation to purchase the American company. And now they no longer had to pirate the product. They could now actually, you know, produce the, the original product legitimately. And there was no international law protecting the American company from that type of piracy and infringement, right? So it's, it's an uncertain world, not just from a technology perspective, but, uh, you know, ethics is a, is a huge Pandora's box. All right, we have reached the end of our session here. Uh, I'll take one more question if anybody is brave enough to unmute themselves. Going once, going twice. All right, well, I hope that your curiosity has been piqued and that you continue to stay with us through our series. Um, we have two more, and let me just take a quick look here. We have two more topics to go on sort of our foundational stuff we have coming up July 1st, the many faces of robots in the future. Uh, so that's going to go from agricultural robots to cognitive robots to social robots, including that aspect of relationships. And then July 8th, the cutting edge. So if you have never heard of it, chances are you'll hear about it on July 8th. And then we're going to switch gears and we're going to go from July 15th into these technology in context sessions. We're going to look at racial bias, democracy, the future of our planet, the future of learning and the future of relationships and how they are all impacted by these new technologies. So stay with us. Tell your friends about our series and have a great day. Thank you so much.